Welcome, we're joined by documentary filmmaker Emil Gerson. Emil spent a significant amount of time in Karabakh during the 2020 war and also on the front line. Emil, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. So to start off, can you tell us a bit about your background and your own time in the military service? You were in the Royal Marines in Helmand province and are no stranger to active combat. Can you tell us a bit about your past and how you became a journalist? So I, I joined the British military at the age of 18, served 12 years as a Royal Marine commando. Um, and since 2001, it was quite busy for us. So I joined in 2000, served um, several tours of Afghanistan and also the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Left in 2012 and then went into private security work. I was doing bodyguarding work and anti-piracy work um, in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Nigeria. And then I, my father is Syrian, he's a Christian Syrian. And I met men that were going out to fight with the Kurds against Islamic State. Um, and then I realised Mohammed Demwazi, who was dubbed Jihadi John, went to the same school as me in London. So I approached a TV company and said, I've got this idea for a documentary on Western volunteers fighting against Islamic State. And they were up for it. They were very keen for the idea of making a documentary. And then a couple of days before, they pulled out of the, the idea because it was too dangerous. So I bought myself a camera and I went out to Syria and Iraq. And for two and a half years, that's how I started making documentaries by going back and forth. Um, documenting men and why their motives to fight Islamic State. And then after that I went to film school and then I made another feature documentary on volunteer fighters in the war in Ukraine um, against the pro-Russian separatists. And then since then I've just been making films, documenting um, and I specialise in war zones. Mm. And um, what made you come to cover the 2020 Karabakh war uh, and what made you stay so long? Because you spent nearly in total three months mm. uh, covering that. Uh, you even returned to the UK only to return again to Nagorno-Karabakh. So what made you become so engaged? Well, when the war first started, because like I was saying, people know me for going to war zones and documenting what's going on. Um, my work's at grassroots level, telling human stories in conflict. Um, War isn't about the shooting, it's about what goes on behind the scenes in the wars, and that's what I capture in my documentaries. Um, in the two documentaries previously, Robin Hood Complex is a, um, two, uh, two feature films. Um, so when this war started, everyone was like, are you going out to cover this war? Um, I self-fund everything, and then try to sell the product at the end to earn my money. Um, and so people were like, you're going out, and I was looking at the 2016 war, where it was only four days, and I thought, an investment of time and money by the time I get out here, get the access, is the war going to be over? And so I gave it about a week and then I could see just through the online presence of what was going on in this conflict that it was escalating, especially with the drone warfare. So I just bit the bullets, booked myself a ticket and came out and then for the first two weeks I was over, um, in, based out of the panicker moving around and just documenting what was going on. And to begin with, I wasn't going to make a feature documentary. It was more just reporting because people didn't know what was going on because there was a massive media blackout. And the main reason for the media blackout was because the world is busy with COVID. There was the US elections. Everyone was interested in what was going on with Trump. Is he going to be reelected? And so really no one was talking about it. So when I came out for the first two weeks, I realized that there was definitely a story here. I learned a lot about the history of Armenia and what was going on. So then I returned to the UK and then came back um, to make a feature documentary. And that's what I've been doing now. And you were also one of the few journalists who got the opportunity to go to the front line. Um, can you speak a bit on that? And can you also um, compare possibly what you saw in the Second Karabakh War compared to other conflicts mm. you have covered and seen or served in even? Well, I struggled to get access to the front line because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defence were restricting access because I think they didn't really know how to deal with press in a modern day war in the sense that they didn't understand what independence and freelancers and how it works in the Western world, that they're more engaged in getting big name companies to cover stories. And not only that, they're more concerned with Russian journalists covering the story than foreigners like myself. So it was a massive struggle for me to get access. Um, I was restricted on what I can film, what I couldn't film. You can't feel that truck driving down the road. You can't film that soldier, soldier there. And it, it was really frustrating, especially as you're documenting history here. And, um, and in hindsight now, I think it's a, I've been speaking to several people in, in high positions and they see it was a massive failure by not allowing journalists like myself and filmmakers to document what was going on. Because now they haven't got that 
evidence to say, okay, well, what actually happened in the conflict? Um, so I've been trying to piece it all together now, um, post. But really, with this war, it was very different to any other war zone I've been in. Um, like I served in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, as a soldier, as a commando myself, and then I've been in several war zones since as a filmmaker. Um, but really, this war was so different because the drone threat, the threat from the air, because this was the first time I was, I was on a side that didn't have the air control. And, and I, in, even my, in hindsight, I was lo looking back at when I was fighting the Taliban or Al-Qaeda and stuff like that, um, or filming with ISIS, against ISIS, and thinking that how they must have felt, always worried about what's above them and what's watching them. And that's how I felt being with the Armenians, is that they didn't control the skies because the drone threat was so massive. Um, so yeah, it was a really different war for me. And not only that, the information war yeah. was totally different here. So really, modern warfare, this war has, has demonstrated to the world on how future wars are going to be played out, I think, especially with the air cover of drones and information space. Mm. And you spent a great deal of time with Armenian servicemen, many of whom are very young. Uh, what was your impression of them and what did you think of them in general? Did anything surprise you in particular about them? Yeah, because a lot of people, like even yesterday I was on the front line and posting pictures and people saying, oh, they're so young, these young boys. And, but I went to war in Afghanistan at the age of 19. Um, throughout history, young men fight wars. And this is, it's, I think it's people see the illusion of watching films where they see the old haggard man who's like a warrior and such. But really, wars are fought by the young generation. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of young soldiers and I've met old soldiers as well, volunteer soldiers and full-time soldiers. And... Generally, across the board, when I've, whenever I've been with militaries, it's all this, generally the people are the same, as young men or old men as such. And, um, but what I saw here in Armenia was that people were fighting for their existence in the sense that when I saw people fighting against the Islamic State when I was with the Kurds, yeah, they knew if the, if the Islamic State had taken their territory, the chances are they were all going to be executed and murdered. But I think here in Armenia, people were fighting for the existence of the memories and the intergeneration trauma of the genocide in the sense that if they didn't stop the Turks or the Azerbaijanis here, it, they would be in a city now as such. Um, so really I got that sense from a lot of the, the soldiers that they were fighting for survival. And yeah, and I always, even though I'm an ex-commander myself, I do admire the, the fight that people have in them. And I saw that on the front line. And, and this is the way the disconnect between the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other organisations here, the MOD, who are like restricting and telling people's story, is every soldier I met wanted their face on camera. They wanted the world to tell their story and um, because they, they felt the world had forgotten about them. And it was very much because Armenia was forgotten about in this war because there was so much going on elsewhere. Um, so now when I'm meeting the soldiers, they're all happy to speak to me because they've seen the work I've been doing here and they want to tell their story because they, want, they don't want it to happen again. And um, did you try or want possibly to cover the conflict from the Azerbaijani side? Um, not really, because um, like I say, my father is a Syrian Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very passionate about the war in Syria and how the war in Syria was manipulated by the West and Saudi Arabia with the, the political agenda for the geopolitics in that region. And I thought I could see it happening here again, is that the, fact, the sense that Obviously, I don't want to get too political as a, as a filmmaker, but I can see how people's stories can be forgotten very easily because of the alliance with Turkey and NATO. So, yeah, really, Azerbaijan side, they're restricting access to journalists. I knew one guy that was over there as a freelancer, and he was getting restricted where he can go, what he could film as such. And I didn't want to fall into the sense of being a mouthpiece of propaganda on that and wherefore even though I was very restricted here in Armenia and I didn't have the freedom of access as I potentially wanted but still I had a more free reign to tell the story I wanted and I thought the fact is the survival of the Armenian race as such I think is a very important story it is a very much a David versus Goliath um, story and I think that was a very important story to tell and that's what the documentary will be focusing on. And you also covered the anti-government protests in Yerevan once the war had ended. I'm interested if you saw a contrast between what people were saying and what you were seeing in Yerevan as opposed to uh, people in Artsakh. Yeah, so, so on November the 10th, so on the November, on the November the 10th I was planning to go back to the front line. Um, we had access um, sorted out and then at three o'clock in the morning I got a phone call get down to Republic Square, it's going off. So I went down there and it was confusion. No one knew what was going on. Um, 
I was stood around the larder car with the, the trunk open and in the back was a sound system and someone plugged their phone in to Facebook to listen to the Prime Minister's speech and the footage we've got is, 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 is amazing because people are like, have we won, have we lost? What is he saying? We don't know. And the frustration that people were having was smashing up um, the building. And me and my cameraman, were, people were like shouting at us, calling us Turks. And they didn't know who we were. They just like, they didn't like us because we've got cameras, you're Turks, go away. And it, that, that was, it's because of the anger. People didn't know where to direct their, to channel their anger. And they were just picking out journalists as such because it was a massive confusion. And people were resentful at that time from what I was seeing. People were like, why have we given up? Clearly, at the grassroots level, individuals like us don't know what's going on at higher levels. Um, we didn't know what was going on. And then I left Republic Square. We managed to get two hours sleep, and then we drove straight to Goris, where we actually linked up with the Russians, who were all lined out with their tanks going in across the border. And we tagged on with them because they thought we were Armenian journalists. All the Armenian soldiers thought we were Russian journalists, and we just moved in with them, um, just short of Shushi. Um, and then we, we turned and drove round to the north and then came in through Stepanica the other way and then met the Russians and the Armenians as they were all coming on down through the hill. So yeah, it was really confusing because I think the Prime Minister didn't explain it very clearly what was going on on that day because there was mixed messages like we will fight on but it's the right decision and so it was really up in the air what was going on. Mm. And um, you have been covering this war for about three months now and the aftermath. Uh, how long do you plan now to stay in Armenia? So I'm planning on returning back to the UK next week and um, because it's my flight. I'd love to extend it if I could. Um, but yeah, so really now for the documentary is a lot of people are asking me, when's the documentary yeah. coming out? And it's, it's that question is, at the moment, we still haven't got a commission for it. It's um, still an independent project, still looking in for potential producers to come on board so then get it to a bigger audience and such. And to begin with, I was very, I was very held back on the documentary in the sense that I didn't want any Armenian involvement in it because I thought it needs to be objective. You can't have any connections to Armenia because people will discredit it. But since the longer, the longer I've been in Armenia, the more I've seen what goes on online with the Azeri trolls and the Turk trolls and such is whatever I do, it'll be discredited. So it doesn't really matter. So slowly I've been using, um, assisting by Armenian cameramen have been jumping on with me, helping me out, and there's a lot more Armenian support for it. Um, however, the narrative is totally independent. It will be independent by myself. And a lot of people are asking, when is it gonna come out? But at the moment, we don't know how, when it's gonna be um, ready because it's a feature film, it's gonna be 80 minutes. It's not a quick evolution to make such a feature film. And the story needs to be told right because this is documenting history. This will go down and some of the footage we've got um, of people burning their houses and stuff and the human stories is, is, will go down and, and it's not me being um, egotistic about it, but people will look at this in years to come and go, wow, we, we, we see that. And that, that's why I was a bit frustrated when I was trying to get access um, to certain locations. But, the documentary title we're going for is 45 Days, A Fight for a Nation. And the reason 45 days is because, one, the war was 44 days, but on the 45th was November the 10th. That was the turning point. And that was when the deal was signed. And then it's a peace deal. A lot of people would dispute that it's a peace deal as such, but that's what they were calling it. And the Russians moved in and the Russian influence. So I think the 45th day out of all the days is the most crucial turning point in history for Armenia. and. Even now, going back to Stepanaka, I've only returned yesterday from Stepanaka, um, you see the Russian influence there. And I think this is going to be a long-term play out here. And I can't actually predict what's going on. But what you were saying earlier about the people in Yerevan compared to people in Stepanaka, for example, the difference in moods and tempo is what I'm seeing in Stepanaka and around, I was in Martuni yesterday as well, is people want to get on with their lives. People just want to get on. And they know the Zeris are only a few hundred yards down the road and the Russian peacekeepers are there as well. But people's like, this is what we've got to deal with. Now we need to move on. And I think people in Yerevan are very disconnected to what's going on in the Kavak region. And then you've got the American, um, not just Americans, but the diaspora who are even a bigger disconnect, who feel as though that they've lost something. And I see the moods between the diaspora, um, mainland Armenia and the Kavak region is that there's three different moods going on. And even like if I post a picture of people in bars, um, here in Europe, and, why, and people are messaging me and going, why are they out dancing? Why are they celebrating? And it's, it's 
the people here want to get on with life because you can't sit there and mourn. And yeah, by all means, sit in Glendale and mourn about what's going on here because it hasn't impacted your life daily. You can still go about your normal life, but people here want to get on with life and they've got to deal with what they've got to deal with. And I think there is, especially in your family, uh, you, you see it yourself, there's a lot of tension politically on where they move forward with the government. But yeah, there's definitely a disconnect between what's going on in um, Karabakh, what's going on here and what's going on in Diaspora. It's quite interesting. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and finally, I want to ask, um, what did you think of Armenia and Armenians? And would you have a message for Armenians now, many of whom feel uh, in this state of military defeat that they are grieving, they are traumatized almost. What would your message be to Armenians? And what do you think about Armenia? Yeah, it's one of these questions is about how does it feel to lose a war as such? And how do you measure loss as such? And I think that's the hardest thing to answer is, is losing territory a loss? Um, or is the future the way to move forward and how you project yourself to moving forward politically um, a win or a, a loss here? Um, so it's very hard for me as an outsider to say what, how that must feel for people. But I've enjoyed my time in Armenia. Um, I've eaten far too much food being here because everyone feeds me everywhere I go. Um, but yeah, no, I've had a great time here and people have really looked after me as, as such and I think it's a great country. Um, and I'm proud to have been able to work here. On, uh, here. But the future for Armenia, and it's, no one knows politically where it's going to go from here. But I think definitely, I think Armenia, the control of Russia, the influence of Russia that's going to be here, is going to be here for a long time. Yeah. Well, Enel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.